Why and how do you do it? Please, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked me that. Thank you. Um, yes, so I'm here from uh, London, UCL, to tell you a bit about uh, work we've been doing at UCL, an open science initiative, which is to establish an open access university press. Uh, and I'm here because the UCL press is a department of the library at UCL. So I am going to tell you a little bit about um, what we've been doing in the last couple of years and how well we think we're doing and what we've learned and then just uh, highlight a couple of special initiatives uh, that we've been working on. The key to this though is that uh, from the outset we've had very strong senior level support from UCL because of their dissatisfaction with the current publishing system, especially for monographs. And there's a quote here from the Vice Provost, Vice Rector equivalent for research, um, stating quite clearly that he feels that current publishing processes are not delivering effective dissemination of research, they're mitigating against it. There was a little, um, a small piece of research took place in the UK recently, uh, which uh, 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 stated that the average monograph sale for academic books in the UK in 2014 was 60 copies. That does tend to bear out this feeling from uh, UCL's senior management that research is not really being effectively disseminated through uh, conventional publishing processes. And UCL is very keen that its research is made globally available and becomes very impactful. <clears throat> so that, uh, that sets the tone for what we've been doing, and that's really the basis for, for, for how it's been funded. Specifically, um, why we're doing this, well, I've already explained uh, a feeling that publishing is not really delivering effective dissemination. Another factor was that in the UK, uh, at least, a lot of money has recently gone into open access uh, from the research funders. But the nature of that funding has been that it has tended to be spent in STEM subjects on uh, APCs for journal articles. So there was a feeling that perhaps we could do something for the arts, humanities and social sciences. Um, UCL's senior management were also historically very impressed with UCL's institutional repository, which of course is a much older um, piece of technology. They were particularly pleased to see the size of the download figures for UCL's theses in the institutional repository. Because a, a, a hard copy thesis might get 10, 20 consultations, you know, in 100 years. Thousands of downloads were being made of UCL theses right across the globe, so we could demonstrate that. And um, that suggested that the taking more responsibility for publishing into a university uh, might deliver even more impact um, for UCL research. And then finally, we're working with authors here who are very keen to work with us because they want their work to be read. So in that sense, uh, a university press, an open access university press, is a very timely and appropriate contribution to the open science agenda. In practical terms, <clears throat> Well, we launched in June 2015. There was an old university press imprint for UCL which had died, so we, um, we repatriated it and um, resurrected it. We've got four and a half staff working on UCL press publishing. Uh, they've all got publishing backgrounds. We don't just publish UCL research. However, about 90% of what we've published is from UCL. Uh, we're, we're publishing researchers at all levels. There's professorial interest, uh, we've got interest from early career researchers right across the range. There's a standard charge of £5,000 per book. For UCL authors, we, we cover that, it's waived. Uh, external authors do have to pay, which partly accounts for the um, disproportionately high level of UCL authorship at the moment, I think. Everything's peer-reviewed, everything's typeset, everything's copy-edited, it's, uh, it's proper publishing, there's no corner-cutting going on. <clears throat> In terms of scope, 
We've been pretty eclectic. We started out with a kind of open call, who's interested in this, who wants to publish something, and um, <clears throat> had interest from a range of disciplines. But as, as the months have worn on, we have tended to find natural strengths in anthropology, architecture, built environment, history. So if we come to develop any spare capacity for proactive commissioning of content, then we'll be looking to strengthen and build on those, uh, those naturally strong um, disciplinary areas. And uh, we're working our way up to publishing 50 books a year. Excuse me. <clears throat> right, sorry, getting a bit confused by the technology. So I can tell you a bit about what we've um, you know, physically been publishing, particularly on the monographs. We've now got a very small backlist of 56 books in the last two years. We publish research monographs, edited collections, we publish textbooks, I'll come back to those later. Everything has an open access uh, uh, copy, version. Version is the word I was looking for. There's a free PDF of everything and there's also a free HTML version of every book we publish. We do, however, make things available in other formats which are um, sold. One is print on demand and then we do a couple of ebook formats as well. This, this is our um, most successful series to date. Um, <clears throat> it's a collection of anthropological field studies of social media uh, in different countries. Um, so, for instance, if you're in northern Chile and you want to take a fashionable selfie, you have to include your feet. Um, it's full of um, anthropological research insights like that. There's ten books in the series. We, we're publishing these as part of a much, much bigger um, set of outputs, including blogs, videos, uh, they've developed a MOOC. It's a very high profile project, so um, we're very pleased with that one. Everything, um, as I say, has um, a free PDF uh, available and everything is available through HTML through this browser platform that we've developed. Uh, it allows um, highlighting, annotation, citation, but the important thing about this platform is that it also um, supports enrichment of content. So we're able to embed videos, uh, audio, images. We've just commissioned a new series uh, of grammars of uh, rare languages. So we expect to have speakers in this platform showing um, uh, audio visual support for those, uh, for those books. Um, it also allows slightly different flows through the books. Uh, you can do this in a sort of non-linear way, by theme or chronologically. Um, <clears throat> one particular development of this platform is called the BOOC, uh, which I stands for Books as Open Online Content. This was the product of a two-year uh, research project funded by the UK Arts Humanities Research Council. And uh, this is what they think the future of the book will look like. It is a live book. It's full of different outputs, uh, long, long writings, short writings, podcasts, audiovisual stuff. Um, the idea being that it's constantly evolving and being added to over time. Because it's actually about the future of the book, it's kind of self-referential, but nonetheless, you may think, well, is this the future of academic publishing? Um, time will tell. Anyway, our platforms are supporting that. I'm not going to say too much about journals today, but we also have eight journals and we're looking to build those. And as well as those academic journals, um, we also host journals for students. So students form themselves into editorial boards. And they do all the submission and all the peer review and all the publishing and all the promotion, all we're, all we're doing is hosting the content and giving them a bit of training. Um, it's a really quick win for UCL. It's, um, UCL has a strategic commitment to research-based learning. And what we're doing here is helping to connect students with you know, uh, uh, the whole research life cycle by giving them these tools. 
So again, it doesn't cost much, uh, and it's a very quick win, and it's another benefit of having a, a university press. <clears throat> so we've been going for a couple of years. Oops, sorry, I missed a slide. Um, this just basically shows where you can find UCL uh, uh, press metadata. Um, everywhere from OAP and to Amazon, really. World Reader down there is a charity supporting free uh, access to free ebooks for the Global South. So we're very pleased to be partnering them in this. <clears throat> a couple of years on, we have been able to uh, assemble some data about how we've been doing in terms of downloads and sales. And the first thing, of course, is the big picture. Um, 566,000 downloads of UCL Press stuff since we started in June 2015 across 193 countries. Now, that's obviously not um, as insightful as the data that was presented by the previous speaker, but, you know, it's, this is the big picture and this is what is impressing UCL and encouraging them to think that they are getting some return on their investment in the press because UCL research is being downloaded all over the world a lot. Uh, looking at individual book performance, this is the sort of top five. The social media series that I mentioned has dominated the downloads so far. That's partly because it's been very effectively promoted as part of a much bigger project. But also, they're good reads, they're very accessible books, and they're very topical. The fourth one there, though, is a, is a good example uh, of, of what we're doing. Sustainable food systems. Um, it's about agrarian economics. It's had 20,000 downloads worldwide. You do have to ask yourself who would read it, buy it, uh, access it in a conventional you know, publication sales system whereby the average sale of titles is currently 60 copies. Uh, we're pretty sure it wouldn't get 20,000 uses. <clears throat> Where are the downloads coming from? Um, mainly in the States, as it happens, 47% of downloads in the US. That is partly because of a very effective partnership that we've started with JSTOR. Um, they opened JSTOR Open uh, in October 2016, and UCL Press content is part of that service. So more than half of our downloads are now coming through JSTOR's Open platform. Moving away from the free stuff, um, as I said before, we are still selling print-on-demand and um, e-books. Two questions here, really. One is, um, is open access killing book sales? <clears throat> In our case, probably not. Uh, not of print, certainly. We are averaging 100 or so copies sold in the first year of publication. The flagship social media book has uh, currently sold about 450 copies. Um, <clears throat> there's probably, a, well, perhaps anyway, a sort of try-before-you-buy effect going on here. People are able to sample the book, you know, uh, richly and, and, and lengthily, thanks to open access. And then if an individual scholar or member of the public really wants the book on their shelves, off they go. They can go and take a copy. Um, the other thing to note, though, is nearly all the sales are in print. There is very little interest in EPUB and Kindle sales from our stuff, and I think that's understandable when we're giving away a free PDF as well. <coughs> <coughs> as for where print sales are occurring, mostly in the UK. And um, that's completely inconsistent with the patterns of uh, download of the electronic versions of the stuff. The UK only um, accounts for about 18% of our downloads. So clearly there's a misalignment going on there. I don't think it's that people in the UK are completely addicted to print at the expense of anything electronic. Um, more likely it's because of this. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> sorry. 
it's more likely because we've got specialist distributors uh, in the UK working uh, as you would expect with um, to um, you know disseminate uh, news about print availability and we haven't got those in the States and we haven't got them in Europe so we're requiring those for next year so these this um, these proportions should start to level out a bit um, come then come uh, 2018 <clears throat> But the main thing is that um, authors really like what we're doing. So we have uh, just an example tweet here, um, Dilly Fung, her book on the connected curriculum, um, 1,600 copies downloaded free in the first three weeks. It's great to write for UCL Press. And that's the sort of author reaction that we're getting. And that's, uh, you know, illustrates that we're doing something right. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, just briefly, um, a couple of areas to look at in perhaps a little more detail. <clears throat> We're very interested in textbooks. Uh, as you know, it's a huge market, um, reportedly 200 million pounds a year in the UK. So that's great for commercial publishers and um, fine. And they have a model which is still largely based on individual sales to students. Digital packages like those that have been developed for journals over the years uh, aren't really the norm. Uh, they tend to be very expensive where they do exist and often there are digital rights management issues that prevent them from being um, of optimal use to the student community. So students are still paying for textbooks or coming to the library to borrow them. Libraries are therefore giving up space to house still multiple copies of student textbooks. Um, I did a little bit of research into UCL's holdings. There are 21 books of which we hold more than 100 copies um, at UCL. And there is one book of which we hold 336 copies on our shelves. That is a, a caseful. <clears throat> so all that space could be used much better, uh, in much better ways to support the student experience. <clears throat> with them um, space improvements and so on so we would like to get down to commissioning open access textbooks specifically as well as our research uh, monographs there are two issues there that make that a little bit tricky one is in the uk textbooks aren't necessarily eligible for um research assessment secondly we're an open access press so we're not going to pay anyone royalties so those are two barriers <clears throat> However, we've already got a couple of um, textbooks out in print and we've got a five lined up um, for publication. There's one here on plastic surgery uh, from the Burns unit at the Royal Free Hospital, which has already been downloaded 20,000 times across the globe. Another one here on public archaeology, which is a fairly cutting edge area of um, archaeological research. <clears throat> So having taken some encouragement from these two and the other three that we had already commissioned, we uh, put a call out in May this year for new textbooks. Particularly um, for um, any courses with extravagantly large numbers of students. Um, you know, you get 300 medical students a year at UCL. <clears throat> uh, or where there is some weakness in current provision. For instance, it's very expensive, it's out of date, or the course is so new that the textbook hasn't actually caught up with it yet. And to get round the issue of royalties, we decided we would make a very generous payment of £1,500 to any author that came forward and gave us a textbook. And we did get quite a lot of interest. We had 12 um, initial proposals, and those have come down to nine full proposals, which we're currently evaluating for um, possible publication. Um, <clears throat> so um, this has the potential to be quite disruptive if we get it right. We haven't quite had the interest that we would have hoped for from medical sciences, chemistry, engineering, mathematics, where those really big, big holdings of multiple copies are on UCL library shelves, but um, we'll keep working on that. Uh, another thing briefly to mention is around publishing services. Now, you're probably thinking, well, this is all very nice, but, you know, how much does it cost and so on. Um, UCL is paying for this uh, to, to disseminate its research more effectively, and we are showing them that they are getting good return on their investment. 
So it's not really the case that we need to make a profit. We don't really even need to break even. UCL's funding this in the way that it funds a library service, for instance. However, we do have uh, some income streams anyway. Uh, as I've already explained, we do sell print copies where people wish, wish to, um, to, to, to order them, only at cost. <clears throat> we uh, have some revenue coming in through partnerships, for instance, with Knowledge Unlatched. We've started offering consultancy and we have a couple of contracts now uh, to help other universities move forward with their open access publishing initiatives. And um, we have come to develop um, the concept of publishing services, <clears throat> whereby basically we host and manage a university's publishing services for them, and the partner university decides what to publish, handles all the peer review. It should be significantly cheaper for a university than setting up an in-house publishing service in the way that UCL has done. <clears throat> So there's potential there for a win-win uh, situation. Um, <clears throat> so we're still developing that one. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Next steps generally. Um, I've talked a bit about textbooks. Publishing them is one thing. Getting them into the curriculum is another. So we really need to think about how to invest in uh, marketing textbooks to people who are running courses and indeed their librarians. Developing the publishing services that I've just mentioned. Thinking about impact. Firstly, downloads. Okay, so lots of downloads, that's great. But it's not telling as much that's qualitative. Can we dig more deeply into those big download figures and uh, find out more about how and where UCL research is being consumed? And then, of course, we need to look at the new open science metrics as well and see what use we can make of these as they develop. I said I wasn't going to talk much about journals, and I won't, but we're looking at open peer review for the journals, and we're also thinking of starting a mega journal. <clears throat> and uh, I think Robert Kiley is speaking this afternoon, so it'll be a bit like um, welcome open research. <clears throat> and um, I'm quite keen that all this content that we've now assembled with our 56 books and counting should be made available for text mining, uh, if only as a starting point for training UCL's early career researchers. It seems a real waste of our corpus if we can't even get that far with it. So we'll be looking into text mining as well in the coming months. <clears throat> Just a few sort of um, quotes from UCL authors and, and senior colleagues. Um, it's a very, very positive response from the UCL community. They talk about quality, they talk about innovation, they talk about open access and reaching a wide audience. Basically, the UCL community likes what we're doing. That was all I wanted to share with you today. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to try to answer them. Thank you. We now have time for questions and comments. Thank you for your speech, Martin. It was very uh, interesting and, and uh, uh, impressive. Uh, I was wondering what kind of competition uh, do you face uh, when the researchers are, are deciding where to publish, is it, uh, has it been easy to, to convince the researchers to publish in your uh, not a, Not all of them. There is still perceived reputational advantage to going to uh, established commercial publishers, for instance, the two university presses in the UK. We have been helped by the fact that some very senior authors, for instance, Danny Miller, who ran that whole um, social media series that I mentioned two or three times, have absolutely seen the light about open access and have been willing to evangelize for us. So um, senior researchers and PIs are starting to convince their junior researchers that um, there's good in this. So we, we, we get a very large number of very well-written proposals coming through to our board for consideration every month. And uh, that number is steadily increasing. 
And we always ask them, why do they want to publish with the UCL Press? And they always say, it's because of open access. I want people to read my research. So the balance is changing. You know, we've got to establish a reputation here, but we're, we're going in the right direction. Thank you very much, Martin. It was very interesting. Um, in, in Finland, uh, Finnish libraries keep a lot of textbooks, and I found that part of your presentation <laughs> very, very interesting. And I, I would say that it's, it, it's really important to share uh, experiences related to, to that, that field, because that, that could mean a lot of uh, savings in space and, and I mean that very cost. So that was sort of quite quite interesting part. But also the next steps which you are planning is is really interesting. Text and data mining, what you can learn from that. Will there be some new discoveries through through yeah. that the mega journal thing? So I, I hope that you you keep on sort of really telling what, what is happening and then so an example for other libraries because it's it, it can be seen as one track in open access publishing that universities really now are forming their own presses. We see in Finland a couple of universities and also in, in Europe there is some activity in this, this round. So this was more a comment. Thank you for your talk. Thank you for your comment. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> hey, it's time for lunch. <laughs>